July 29th, 1911. Does that date ring a bell? If you're trying to jog your memory to see which history lesson you might have forgotten, don't worry. This was not in your textbooks. But if you're Bengali like me, or if you have roots in Calcutta, then there is a chance you might have come across this date. Calcutta in 1911 was the capital of the British Indian Empire. And on this day, the city looked like it was hosting a massive carnival. Thousands of people had travelled to Calcutta that day. Special trains were pressed into service, steamer services were arranged to bring people in from rural Bengal. They came from everywhere, from Patna, from Dhaka, from Assam. The city had never witnessed a spectacle of this kind. Its iconic trams were struggling to cope. The mess bodies, that's boarding houses, were well over capacity, but people still poured in. Even Calcutta's residents were swept up in this wave. Not a single person in the city's business district was in any mood to work. Here street corners bustled with discussions, their tea shops thronged with animated debates, and if you listen closely, everyone had only one thing on their minds. Football. No, I'm not kidding. All of this hoi choi was for a football match. The final of the IFA Shield, and since its inception in 1893, for 17 long years, an Indian team had never reached the finals. But on that day in July 1911, this changed. For the first time ever, an Indian team managed to break the curse, boot past all the barriers and reach the final. It was a time of political upheaval. The Indian National Congress had split into two camps. The first camp believed that non-violence was the noble way to independence. The second camp believed the exact opposite. They simply had had enough of the British. All of this anger and resentment had to find an outlet. And it had to go somewhere. And it did. To the football field. So this story isn't just about football. I mean, it is about football, but it's also about being in British India at that time. Because in 1911, an Indian team playing a football match against a British team could never be just a game. It was a battleground between the colonised and their colonisers. Winning this match would be a battle won in the ongoing war. The match? The final of the IFA Shield. And the team? Mohan Bagan. Sheep Dash Bhaduri, Bijoy Dash Bhaduri, Obhilash Ghosh, Bhuti Shukri, Hiralal Mukherjee, Mon Mohan Mukherjee, Rajendra Shengupto, Reverend Shudhi Chatterjee, Habul Sharkar, Kanu Roy, and Neil Madhu Bhattachacha. The Barefoot Boys. From Luminary, this is Barefoot Boys. A podcast about an Indian football team that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British and against all odds emerged as a national symbol. A symbol that told a country fighting for independence, we can win. I'm Konkona Sen Sharma. Okay, I know what you're thinking. India and football. Do we really have a football history to boast about? Aren't we like ranked 100 something in the world today? Well, believe it or not, we do have a football history and a glorious one at that. In the first decade after independence, our country was known in the football world as the Brazil of Asia. Imagine. But let's go back. Let's go back a little. How did Bengalis fall in love with football in the first place? In fact, when? How? Did football even come to India? Sometime in the 1800s, when the British Empire was rapidly expanding and the need of the hour was for strong men who held strong beliefs of patriotic duty, self-sacrifice and discipline, the British in England realised that one way to introduce young boys to these cherished ideals was through games like football and cricket. Their clergy also endorsed this view. The Church of England called it muscular Christianity. Their reasoning was simple. They felt that vigorous and masculine physical activity could help build character and turn young men away from masturbation and homosexuality. <laughs> Sweet. 
As football became popular in England, it also travelled outside the country to British colonies like India. High-ranking British officers stationed in India would play the game in the barracks. And that's when Indians, primarily the rank-and-file soldiers, saw football being played for the first time. In Calcutta, the garrison at Fort William played a big part in introducing football to the city. A lot of the early football games were played on the Moidan right in front of Fort William. That's why even today, locals call the Moidan Godirmat, the fort ground. Apart from the soldiers, the royals, sons and grandsons of our Maharajas and Nawabs, they had also picked up the game at their boarding schools. Like the Mayo College in Ajmer, the Lawrence School in Sanawar, schools the British had set up in India. These boarding schools preached the greatness of the British cause and way of life and Lord Macaulay, who is believed to have introduced Western education to India, famously said that Britain needed to create a new class of people in India. This class would be Indian in blood and colour, but English in tastes, in opinions, in morals and in intellect. In other words, the British felt that these character-building sports could civilise Indians. Discipline, conformity and solidarity, these were qualities that were necessary to be a good subject of the empire and sports apparently could do that. After the revolt of 1857, the British redoubled their efforts to spread British value systems and set up a number of colleges across the country. Presidency College set up the first football team in 1884 and other colleges soon followed suit. And this is what started the ordinary Bengali's tryst with this beautiful game. But there was a problem. And here I'm going to digress for a bit because this just made me so angry. The British didn't think Bengali boys or men were manly enough to play the game. I wish I was joking. There was a stereotype that the British applied to the Bengali. The effete Bengali. The British basically believed that the average Bengali was incapable of taking part in robust and masculine physical activity. Lord Macaulay called Bengalis lazy, meek and cowardly. The physical organisation of the Bengali is feeble even to effeminacy. He lives in a constant vapour bath. His pursuits are sedentary, his limbs delicate, his movements languid. During many ages, he has been trampled upon by men of bolder and more hardy breeds. Courage, independence, veracity are qualities to which his constitution and his situation are equally unfavourable. Where did this baseless stereotype come from? One theory suggested that Bengalis were not a race of fighters and warriors unlike, you know, the Sikhs, the Pathans or the Gorkhas. This was supported by people like Herbert Hope Risley, a colonial official and amateur ethnologist. Risley believed that Bengalis were a weak and stunted race. Why? Because one, he thought the region had a relaxing climate. Two, Bengalis followed what he called an enfeebling diet. And three, the premature maternity of Bengali women. <laughs> and Risley led others to believe his theory was based on scientific facts. This is historian Shobik Naha from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. So, there was kind of uh, a scientific background to it as well because Bengal was kind of the home of cholera and most other epidemic diseases that uh, just, just spawned across the country and ha had a global spread throughout the 19th century. And Bengal was also the epicenter of the disease zone, which was kind of the northern Indian Ocean region in British imagination at the time. So uh, most of the Bengalis, according to the British chroniclers, were always very feeble, very weak-minded, weak-lipped. They were not really prone to do any uh, proper uh, work that, that required a lot of physical activity. And that's not all. British journalist G.W. Stevens added his bit to the stereotype and I must warn you, he did not hold back. By his legs you shall know the Bengali. The leg of a free man is straight or a little bandy so that he can stand on it solidly. The Bengali's leg is either skin and bones, the same size all the way down, with knocking knobs for knees. Or else it is very fat or globular, also turning in at the knees with round thighs like a woman's. The Bengali's leg is the leg of a slave. Hmm. But you know what I find the most interesting? 
one part of elite Bengali society accepted this stereotype. The novelist Bunkim Chandra Chatterjee, for example, wrote that the Bengalis never had any physical valour. Sharula Devi, Rabindranath Tagore's niece, said the Bengali porters she encountered on a train journey could have been knocked down with a blow from a straw hat. But, 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 argued the elites, this was not how the Bengalis originally were. Ask anybody and he will tell you that his father and grandfather were very strong. In the past, Bengal was home to many akharas where landholders and educated gentlemen would hone their strength and stay in shape. But after the British came to India, there was a craze for English education. So much so that it was at the cost of the physical exercise of the older generations. Local and indigenous games like lati fencing, wrestling and sword fights were abandoned. So, the British thought the Bengalis were weak and the Bengalis said, Ask anybody and he will tell you that his father and grandfather were very strong. We were better off before you came along and killed our vigorous spirit. Ha! Anyway, sometime in the late 1800s, a few of these elite Bengalis, mostly the men, you know, because this is the 19th century, but mostly the intelligentsia, the men, the folks who'd studied in English, men of arts and letters, decided to do something to finally counter the stereotype. In 1866, Raj Narayan Basu published a document with a rather long name, Prospectus of a Society for the Promotion of National Feeling Among the Natives of Bengal. <sighs> and he wrote, Now European ideas have penetrated Bengal. A desire for change and progress is everywhere visible. People discontented with old customs and institutions are panting for reform. Already a band of young men have expressed a desire to remove themselves at once from Hindu society and renounce even the Hindu name. It is to be feared that the tide of revolution will sweep away whatever good we have inherited from our ancestors. To prevent this catastrophe and to give a national shape to reforms, it is proposed that a society be established by the influential members of the public for the promotion of a national feeling among the educated natives of Bengal. Without due cultivation of a national feeling, no nation can be eventually great. Meaning, let's promote Hindu music, Sanskrit and Bengali languages, native dressing styles. And along with all this, let's revive national gymnastics exercises. Half a century ago, there was a gymnasium in almost every village. That old practice needed to be brought back to life. Inspired by this booklet, playwright and poet Nabogopal Mitra launched the Hindu Mela in 1867, a festival that was backed by the Tagore family with the idea to showcase indigenous handicraft and to host wrestling and gymnastic competitions. This physical culture movement, which began in the 1870s under the umbrella of Hindu Mala, of Nabogopal Mitro and uh, Rajnara and Boshu, uh, introduced the Bengalis to a kind of renovation of their physical culture, ancient physical culture, which included gymnastic exercises, uh, wrestling. This is Koshik Bandhapadhyay, a sports historian and author of a number of academic articles about football in Bengal. But these did not provide the Bengalis, alias the Indians, any opportunity to uh, kind of show uh, their physical prowess to the British. The Bengali elite needed a different solution. And that brings us back to where we began. Football. They realised that football was the game which would allow them to parley with the British man for man on the field. Not only could Bengalis demonstrate their physical prowess, but it would be through beating the Brits at their own game. The Bengali elite started supporting and patronising football clubs across Calcutta. They founded clubs, encouraged young men to learn the game and even organised tournaments. And there was another group of Bengalis who also decided to encourage the practice of football in Calcutta, but for a different reason. The Bengali Babus were originally the merchant princes of Calcutta. They had become immensely rich by being brokers for the East India Company in the 1700s. But after the 1857 revolt, they lost a lot of their influence. Here's historian Paul de Mayo. The British experience of India shifted from the 18th century quest for adventure and cultural exchange to a 19th century spirit of privilege 
snobbery and and exclusion there was open mockery about the babu's pretensions naturally satirical magazines such as punch regularly published articles and cartoons caricaturing the babu figure like there was a babu of calcutta who lived upon clarified butter till he grew as a bee says cram strasburg geese this ghee fed babu of calcutta this despite the babu's helping the british grow calcutta into the most important outpost of the empire so this is what they figure if the babu sponsored football teams they could signal their wealth it would tell the british that the babu appreciated modern leisure activities as much as they did and more it would provide an opportunity for them to meet the britisher on an equal footing the babu's influence in the political and social scheme of calcutta may have been waning but at least now there was a chance to palta mar the british on the maidan how can i explain palta mar to you reverse hit hit back backlash you get the idea and so this old class of babus funded the pioneering set of native football clubs in the 1880s one of which was our mohan bagan so this is how football came to calcutta and found its footing now that we've gone through the hows and whens and wheres let's get to the who let's go back in time to 1877 Once there was a boy who came from a devout and conservative Hindu feudal family. Every day, this 10-year-old boy would accompany his mother when she went for her holy dip in the Hooghly River. One day the carriage carrying the boy and his mother crossed the ground of the Calcutta Football Club. Back then, this football club only had Britishers playing the game. So as the carriage passed this football ground, the young boy saw a bunch of European men kicking a round object in the air. They would kick the round object and then run around to get to it, and then kick it again. And they kept doing the same thing over and over. The young boy was intrigued. He asked his mother to stop the carriage and climb down to watch them play. Suddenly, the round object came rolling towards him. The boy looked at it. He paused and then picked it up. He was surprised to find that it was not heavy at all. From the other end of the field, someone shouted, "Oi, you! Kick it back!" It was a British soldier asking the boy to kick the ball back to him. The boy did just that. It was probably the first time an Indian had kicked a football. <laughs> Now I have no idea if the story is true, but it could be, and I want it to be. Because even though nobody could know it then, that boy's obsession with the game would change the city and our country forever. It would lead us to that historic final in 1911. and the boy the boy would grow up to be the father of indian football nagendra prasad sarbadikari next on barefoot boys we follow the journey of nagendra prasad sarbadikari and how his ruthless dedication to football took the sport and calcutta by storm Barefoot Boys is a luminary original podcast produced by Rainshine Entertainment and you've been listening to me Konkona Sen Sharma. Gaurav Vaz is our executive producer, Vivek Madan is our director and script supervisor. Our writing team was led by Vivek Madan, Vikram Shah and Archana Nathan who wrote these episodes along with Shankhudeep Sen Gupta, Nevin Thomas, Arka Bhattacharya and Amar Shyas. We recorded the podcast at Island City Studios with Ashir Balsara. Sachi Rajadhaksh is a sound designer and audio producer and Ayan the mixed and mastered these episodes. Thanks to all our guests and experts for their time and valuable inputs. And a special thank you to Sidin Vadukot for his help getting this podcast off the ground. And most of all, thanks to the Amor Akadosh, 11 men who did the impossible. Who taught a country to dream and for a brief moment showed us what freedom felt like long before we were free.